Imagine a world where some people become really, really good at doing dangerous things for the bad guys. We're about to explore the stories of the most dangerous mafia hitmen ever. These guys were like the bosses of being sneaky and tough in the world of crime. They're not just tough, they're legendary for how good they are at doing not-so-nice things. Get ready to hear about these shadowy characters who made the bad side of town even scarier. Richard Kuklinski First up, we have Richard the Iceman Kuklinski, the infamous mafia hitman who struck fear into the hearts of many. Standing at an imposing 6 foot 5 and weighing 300 pounds, Kuklinski's terrifying methods of murder earned him his chilling nickname. Born in 1935 in Jersey City, New Jersey, Kuklinski's childhood was marred by violence and abuse. His father, a violent alcoholic, would often unleash his rage on Richard and his siblings. But it was one tragic incident that would shape the course of Kuklinski's life forever. At the age of just 13, Kuklinski Kuklinski experienced a devastating loss when his abusive father beat his beloved younger brother to death. The loss of his brother marked a turning point in Kuklinski's life. It was the catalyst that transformed him from a troubled young boy into a cold-blooded killer. As Kuklinski grew older, his violent tendencies only intensified. He became involved in criminal activities, running a burglary ring and distributing pirated pornography. He quickly gained a reputation for his ruthlessness and efficiency, earning the nickname The Iceman for his ability to remain calm and composed, even in the face of extreme violence. Kuklinski's modus operandi was as chilling as his nickname. He would lure his victims with promises of lucrative business deals, gaining their trust before striking with deadly precision. His preferred method of killing was often poison, using a nasal spray bottle filled with cyanide to dispatch his victims swiftly and discreetly. But Kuklinski's methods were not limited to poison alone. He was known to use a wide array of weapons, from guns and ice picks to grenades and chainsaws. His choice of weapon depended on the circumstances and the level of brutality he wished to inflict upon his victims. One aspect that made Kuklinski particularly terrifying was his ability to remove any identifying markers from the bodies of his victims. This made it incredibly difficult for law enforcement to determine the time of death or even identify the victims themselves. In some cases, Kuklinski would freeze the bodies, further complicating the forensic process and leaving investigators with little to work with. Despite his violent activities, Kuklinski managed to maintain a seemingly normal family life. He was married twice and had three children who were completely unaware of his true nature. To them, he was a loving father and husband, actively involved in their lives and the community. But Kuklinski's reign of terror would eventually come to an end. In 1986, he was captured by the ATF after being caught on tape agreeing to commit a murder for money. In the subsequent trial, Kuklinski was convicted of multiple murders and sentenced to life imprisonment. His claims of having killed between 100 and 200 people remained unverified, but the sheer brutality of his crimes left a lasting impact on the criminal world. Roy DeMeo. Born in Brooklyn, New York, DeMeo rose through the ranks of the Gambino crime family, leaving a trail of terror and destruction in his wake. As Roy Albert DeMeo grew up in the working-class neighborhoods of Brooklyn, little did anyone know that he would rise to become one of the most feared and notorious figures in the Gambino crime family. Born in 1940 to Italian immigrant parents, DeMeo's early life seemed unremarkable. However, it was during his teenage years that he began to dabble in the world of organized crime. DeMeo's first foray into the criminal underworld was through loan sharks. He quickly established himself as a ruthless and efficient loan shark, preying on those who were desperate for money. With his intimidating presence and reputation for violence, DeMeo was able to extract exorbitant interest rates from his victims, ensuring a steady stream of income for himself. But loan sharking was just the beginning for DeMeo. He soon realized that there was more money to be made in the world of car theft. With his connections and knowledge of the streets, DeMeo began to organize a crew of young men who shared his criminal ambitions. DeMeo's crew quickly gained a reputation for their efficiency and performance professionalism. They were known for their ability to steal cars without leaving a trace, making them a valuable asset to the Gambino family. As their success grew, so did their ambitions. They expanded their operations, targeting high-end vehicles and even stealing cars to order for wealthy clients. But it wasn't just the money that motivated DeMeo and his crew. They reveled in the thrill of the chase, the adrenaline rush of evading the law, and the power that came with their criminal exploits. DeMeo, in particular, relished the control he had over others, using fear and intimidation to maintain his dominance. As DeMeo's criminal empire grew, so did his influence within the Gambino family. He formed alliances with other powerful figures, solidifying his position as a trusted member of the organization. DeMeo's involvement in drug dealing began in the late 1960s, during the height of the drug epidemic in New York City. He recognized the lucrative nature of the drug trade and saw it as a way to increase his wealth and influence further. The DeMeo crew became a force to be reckoned with in the drug trade. They were known for their efficiency and ruthlessness, eliminating 
eliminating any competition that stood in their way. But it wasn't just drugs that DeMeo dabbled in. He also expanded his empire into other illicit activities, such as pornography. With his connections and resources, he was able to produce and distribute adult films, further adding to his wealth and power. He formed alliances and partnerships, solidifying his position as a key player in the underworld. His reputation for violence and his ability to deliver results made him a valuable asset to those who sought his services. But as DeMeo's criminal activities expanded, so did the attention of law enforcement. The FBI and other agencies began to take notice of his involvement in the drug trade and other illicit activities. They started to build a case against him, gathering evidence and testimonies from those who had fallen victim to his crimes. Finally, his empire had its downfall. In 1983, Roy DeMeo's reign of terror came to an end. Paranoid and knowing the end was near, he disappeared, only for his lifeless body to be found later in the trunk of his own car, a victim of the very violence he once orchestrated, Maurizio Avola. Meet Maurizio Avola, the infamous mafia hitman, whose name strikes fear into the hearts of even the most hardened criminals. From his initiation into the secretive organization, to his involvement in over 80 murders and countless armed robberies, Avola's story is one of violence, loyalty, and the haunting consequences of a life steeped in bloodshed. It was the year 1983 when Avola caught the attention of Giovanni Russo, a seasoned mafioso who recognized his exceptional skills with a gun. Impressed by Avola's natural talent for violence, Russo saw in him the potential to become a valuable asset to the organization. Avila's life would never be the same again. Avila's initiation into the Mafia was a chilling affair, shrouded in secrecy and steeped in ancient traditions. On a moonlit night, he was led to a dimly lit room where the air was heavy with the scent of incense. Surrounded by high-ranking members of the organization, Avola was presented with a needle. With a steady hand, Avola pricked his finger, allowing a single drop of blood to stain the cold, hard floor. This act symbolized his commitment to the Mafia, a blood Oath that bound him to a life of loyalty and obedience. From that moment on, Avola's life became a whirlwind of violence and crime. He started small, carrying out robberies for the Mafia, proving his worth with each successful operation. But it wasn't long before Avola was entrusted with a task that would forever change the course of his life, his first murder. Avola's target was a rival gang member who had been causing trouble for the family. With a cold determination in his eyes, Avola stalked his prey, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. And when that moment came, he didn't hesitate. A single gunshot echoed through the night, extinguishing a life and sealing Avola's fate as a hitman. One of the most haunting moments in Avola's life came when he was ordered to kill his friend, Pinuccio De Leo. De Leo had been suspected of betraying the family, and Avola was tasked with eliminating the threat. Life within the Mafia brought Avola wealth, power and distorted respect, lavish possessions, unwavering protection from the family, and a sense of invincibility defined his existence. Yet the haunting memories of victims like Pinuccio De Leo weighed heavily on his soul. But but Avola's life of crime and violence would eventually catch up with him. In 1994, just a day after killing Pinuccio De Leo, Avola's reign of terror came to an abrupt end. The police, acting on a tip, apprehended him, saving his life from the inevitable retribution that awaited him within the ranks of the Mafia. It was during his time in prison that Avola made a life-altering decision. He realized that his loyalty had been misplaced, that his boss had betrayed him, and the organization he had given everything for. In a bold move, Avola decided to break the Mafia's code of silence. He became an informer, cooperating with the authorities and providing crucial information that led to the conviction of over 100 Mafia members. Avila awaited his release from a special prison for Mafia informers in northern Italy, where he was released after five years. His wife, son, and daughter have been given new identities, a fresh start away from the clutches of the Mafia. Avola joined them, leaving behind the horrors of his past and embracing the chance for a new beginning. Abe Reles. Next, we have the infamous Mafia hitman Abe Rellis, also known as Kid Twist. In the dark underbelly of New York City during the mid-20th century, Rellis was a feared figure, responsible for numerous violent acts as a member of Murder, Inc., a contract-killing organization. Rellis was known for his cold-blooded nature and psychopathic tendencies, making him a force to be reckoned with in the criminal underworld. His weapon of choice, an ice pick, added to the chilling brutality of his crimes. Born in 1906 to Jewish immigrant parents, he got into trouble early even going to reform school at just 13. As he grew up in the Brownsville neighborhood, he became known for harassing people and eventually extorting money from store owners. Rila's life took a darker turn when he became a hitman for Murder, Inc., the notorious enforcement arm of Meyer Lansky's National Crime Syndicate during the Prohibition era. Despite his small stature, he was only 5 feet 2 inches tall, Rila's was known for his ruthless acts of violence. In his early criminal days during the 1920s, Rila's and his buddies, Martin Bugsy Goldstein and Harry Pittsburgh Phil Strauss worked for the Shapiro brothers who controlled the Brooklyn Rackets. After serving time for 
for petty crimes, Rellis and Goldstein entered the slot machine business, leading them to make a deal with Meyer Lansky. Revenge fueled Rellis's actions when the Shapiro brothers targeted him and his girlfriend. In a brutal retaliation, Rellis, along with Murder Inc. members Abandando and Mayone, took revenge by killing the Shapiros. Rellis's criminal activities expanded to include loan sharking, crap games, and labor racketeering. Everything changed in 1940 when Rellis found himself implicated in multiple killings. Faced with the prospect of execution, he made a deal with the government to become a witness. He spilled the beans on his boss, Lepke Bacalter, and other members of Murder, Inc., leading to several convictions and executions. Rellis's testimony was crucial not only in bringing down Murder, Inc., but also in exposing the workings of the National Crime Syndicate. He provided details on numerous unsolved murders, helping authorities solve 85 cases, including the killing of Dutch Schultz. However, Rellis's life took a tragic turn. In protective custody at the Half Moon Hotel in Coney Island, he fell to his death from a window in 1941. The circumstances of his death remain mysterious, with speculation about whether he fell, jumped, or was pushed. Mad Sam. On number five, we have Samuel DeStefano, a notorious loan shark and murderer associated with the powerful Chicago outfit. Known for his sadistic and unpredictable behavior, Mad Sam earned his terrifying nicknames, Mad Sam and the Mad Hatter. Mad Sam was not your typical hitman. He had a dark and twisted side that manifested in his torture chamber, a place where his victims experienced unimaginable pain and suffering. Equipped with an array of tools, including an ice pick, Mad Sam took pleasure in inflicting agony upon those who failed to repay their debts. One of Mad Sam's victims was Artie Adler, a restaurant owner who had fallen behind on his payments. In a fit of rage, Mad Sam dragged Adler down to his basement, a place of nightmares, where he subjected him to a brutal torture session. The screams echoed through the walls as Mad Sam unleashed his sadistic tendencies, but fate intervened and Adler suffered a heart attack, succumbing to the stress and pain before Mad Sam could deliver the final blow. It was a narrow escape for Adler, but many others were not as fortunate. Peter Capaletti, a man who attempted to steal money from Mad Sam, met a fate far worse than death. Captured and brought to the torture chamber, Capaletti endured three days of unimaginable torment. Mad Sam reveled in his power, pushing the boundaries of human endurance. Mad Sam's sadistic nature even led him to murder his own brother when the mob ordered a hit on him. No one was safe from his wrath, not even family. Mad Sam's torture chamber became a symbol of fear and horror in Chicago. Mad Sam's brutal reputation caught the attention of the Chicago Outfit, a powerful organized crime syndicate. While he was never officially initiated into the mafia, his association with the mob provided him with a steady stream of high-risk clients for his loan sharking operation. The Chicago outfit recognized Mad Sam's unique talent for extracting money from those who owed debts. His sadistic methods and unpredictable behavior made him a valuable asset, but also a liability. The mob knew they had to keep a close eye on Mad Sam to ensure he didn't go too far. The mob considered Mad Sam too deranged to be fully initiated into their ranks. His unpredictable behavior and extreme methods made him a liability, but that didn't stop him from carrying out his reign of terror. Despite his association with the Chicago outfit, Mad Sam's reign of terror would eventually come to an end. In 1973, he found himself on trial for murder alongside two other mobsters. It was during this trial that his co-defendants saw an opportunity to eliminate him. Tony Spilotro and Chucky Nicoletti, fearing that Mad Sam would implicate them in the crimes, decided to take matters into their own hands. The plan was set in motion. Mad Sam was lured to his own garage, a place where he felt safe and secure. But little did he know that it would become the setting for his final moment. As Mad Sam entered the garage, he was ambushed by Tony Spilotro and Chucky Nicoletti. In a hail of bullets, Mad Sam's reign of terror came to a violent end. The man who had instilled fear in the hearts of so many was now lying lifeless on the cold garage floor. Tommy Karate Born Thomas Patera, this Brooklyn native had a childhood marred by abuse and bullying, shaping him into a cold-blooded individual. Finding solace in martial arts, Patera honed his skills and gained confidence, eventually earning the nickname Tommy Karate. But his journey didn't stop there. Patera's involvement in the drug business led him down a path of violence and murder, carrying out hits for the infamous Bonanno crime family. Patera's involvement in the Bonanno crime family was marked by a trail of bloodshed. He was a cold and calculated hitman known for his martial arts skills and his ability to strike fear into the hearts of his enemies. Patera's victims were not limited to rival gang members or informants. He would kill anyone who posed a threat to his personal life or the secrets of the organization and took pleasure in his killings, relishing in the power and control given to him. Patera's brutality knew no bounds. He would often keep trophies from his victims, a chilling reminder of his deadly deeds. But it wasn't just the act of killing that satisfied him. It was the thrill of the hunt, the power he held over life and death. But it wasn't just about the trophies. It was about sending a message. 
Terra wanted the world to know that he was a force to be reckoned with, that he was untouchable. The authorities knew they had to put an end to Patera's reign of terror. After a three-year investigation, he was finally arrested and brought to justice. The list of victims left in Patera's wake was extensive, including Phyllis Birdie, who met a tragic end after witnessing Patera's wife's fatal drug overdose. Patera shot Birdie in her sleep and dismembered her. In 1992, Patera was convicted of six first-degree murders and sentenced to life in prison. Joseph Barboza Next, we have Joseph Barboza, the infamous mafia hitman known as The Animal. Born in 1932, Joseph Barboza grew up in New Bedford, Massachusetts, surrounded by a world of violence and crime. From a young age, he displayed a natural talent for boxing, earning him the nickname The Animal due to his ferocious fighting style and powerful punches. But it was his association with the Patriarcha crime family that would truly shape his destiny. The Patriarcha crime family, led by Raymond Patriarcha Sr., was one of the most powerful and feared criminal organizations in New England during the 1960s. Barboza, despite not being officially inducted into the family due to his non-Italian ancestry, quickly earned a reputation as a contract killer. Barboza's services as a hitman were in high demand, thanks to his ruthless efficiency and lack of hesitation when it came to taking lives. He became known for his ability to carry out killings without remorse, making him a valuable asset to the Patriarcha crime family. He was also involved in various illegal activities, including drug trafficking, extortion, and loan sharking. Barboza's reputation as a contract killer reached its peak during the 1960s. He was responsible for numerous high-profile murders, eliminating anyone who posed a threat to the Patriarcha crime family or its interests. Barboza's involvement in the murder of Edward Deegan in 1965 showcased his cunning and manipulative nature. He not only played a role in the killing, but also framed six innocent men for the crime. These men were convicted and sentenced to life in prison while Barboza continued his reign of terror. However, justice would eventually catch up with Barboza in a surprising turn of events. In 1967, he made a decision that would change the course of his life forever. Barboza became an FBI informant and entered the Witness Protection Program, making history as the first person in Hawaii American history to do so. Barboza's decision to cooperate with the authorities was a double-edged sword. While it provided him with a chance at a new life, it also put a target on his back. The Patriarcha crime family, furious at his betrayal, would stop at nothing to silence him. And so Barboza's life as an informant began as he testified against high-ranking members of the Patriarcha crime family. His testimony led to the conviction of several individuals, exposing the inner workings of the criminal organization. But as the saying goes, snitches get stitches, and Barboza's actions would have dire consequences. In 1976, Barboza's whereabouts became known to the Patriarcha crime family. He was hunted down and shot dead in San Francisco, marking the tragic end of a life filled with violence and deception. His murder was a chilling reminder of the dangers faced by those who choose to become informants. Giovanni Brusca. Next up, we have one of the most notorious hitmen in Mafia history, Giovanni Brusca. Known as the Swine and the People Slayer, Brusca's name strikes fear into the hearts of those familiar with his brutal reign of terror. As a key member of the Corleonese clan and the right-hand man of Toto Rina, the superboss of Cosa Nostra, Brusca's ruthlessness knew no bounds. Let's start by delving into the events leading up to the fateful day of May 23, 1992. Giovanni Falcone, a renowned anti-mafia prosecutor, had dedicated his life to dismantling the criminal empire that plagued Sicily. Brusca, acting on the orders of Toto Riina, devised a diabolical plan to eliminate Falcone once and for all. He knew that a direct attack on Falcone would be nearly impossible due to the prosecutor's tight security measures. Instead, Brusca decided to target Falcone's vulnerability, the roads he traveled. Under Brusca's command, a team of skilled mafia operatives meticulously planted explosives beneath a road leading to Palermo. The plan was to detonate the explosives as Falcone's car passed over, ensuring his swift and devastating demise. On that fateful day, Falcone, accompanied by his wife and security detail, embarked on his usual journey from Palermo Airport to his home. As Falcone's car approached the designated spot, the explosives were detonated, ripping through the road and engulfing the vehicle in a fiery explosion. The blast was so powerful that it not only claimed the lives of Falcone and his wife, but also those of several members of their security detail. The loss was immeasurable, and Italy mourned the loss of one of its most courageous and dedicated public servants. But Brusca's 
Russia's murderous rampage did not end with Falcone. Just two months later, on July 25, 1992, he orchestrated another high-profile assassination, that of Ignazio Salvo, a prominent businessman and close associate of Falcone. Salvo, like Falcone, had become a target due to his association with the anti-mafia movement. Brusca ordered the execution of Salvo, ensuring that no one would be left to challenge their reign of terror. The loss of Falcone and Salvo was a devastating blow, but it also served as a catalyst for change. Another one of the most chilling and heart-wrenching chapters in Giovanni Brusca's criminal career also involved the kidnapping and murder of an innocent 11-year-old boy named Giuseppe Di Matteo. The events leading up to Giuseppe's abduction can be traced back to the assassination of Giovanni Falcone. In retaliation for one of Falcone's assassins becoming an informant, the Mafia sought to exact revenge on the prosecutor by targeting his family. Brusca, acting on the orders of Toto Riina, devised a plan that would strike at Falcone's heart, his beloved son, Giuseppe. On November 23, 1993, Brusca and his accomplices abducted Giuseppe Di Matteo as he walked home from school. The young boy was forcibly taken from the streets of Palermo, and his life was forever changed by the cruel hands of the Mafia. For the next two years, Giuseppe was held captive in a hidden location, subjected to unimaginable horrors and psychological torment. Brusca and his associates used the young boy as a pawn in their twisted game, hoping to break the spirit of Giovanni Falcone and anyone who stood against the Mafia. In 1995, as the pressure on the Mafia intensified and their grip on power began to slip, Brusca made the chilling decision to end Giuseppe's life. The young boy, who had endured unimaginable suffering, was strangled to death by his captors. After years of terrorizing Sicily as one of the Mafia's most ruthless hitmen, Giovanni Brusca's life took an unexpected turn when he was captured by authorities in 1996. Facing the prospect of spending the rest of his life behind bars, Brusca made a decision that would forever change the course of his life. He chose to become a pentito, a government witness, and collaborate with prosecutors in their fight against the Mafia. This unexpected turn of events would have far-reaching consequences and expose the inner workings of Cosa Nostra. Brusca's collaboration proved to be instrumental in dismantling the Corleonese clan and bringing other high-ranking members of the Mafia to justice. His testimony provided crucial evidence that led to the arrest and conviction of numerous Mafia bosses, including Toto Rina himself. As a result of his cooperation, Brusca's sentence was reduced from life imprisonment to 26 years. This decision sparked controversy and outrage among the families of his victims and the general public. Many argued that his reduced sentence did not adequately reflect the severity of his crimes or provide justice for those affected. On the 31st of May 2021, Brusca was released, 45 days before the conclusion of his sentence, on parole for four years. Frank Abandando. Next on our list is the Mafia hitman, Frank Abandando, also known as The Dasher. Born on July 11, 1910 in New York City, Abandando's criminal career involved extortion, gambling, loan sharking, and murder. His preferred method of killing was stabbing his victims through the heart with an ice pick, leaving a trail of terror in his wake. Frank Abandando's involvement with Murder, Inc. marked a turning point in his criminal career, propelling him into the ranks of the most feared and ruthless hitmen in the history of organized crime. As a member of this notorious criminal organization, Abandando became a key player in carrying out contract killings on behalf of the Italian-American Mafia. Murder, Inc., also known as the Combination or the Brownsville Boys, was a secret society of contract killers that operated primarily in the 1920s and 1930s. Their main objective was to eliminate rival gang members, witnesses, and anyone who posed a threat to the Mafia's criminal activities. The group was known for its efficiency, professionalism, and ability to carry out murders without leaving a trace. Abandando's reputation as a skilled and ruthless hitman caught the attention of the leaders of Murder, Inc. Under the guidance of Murder, Inc., Abandando was involved in numerous killings, mostly in the Brooklyn area. One of the most shocking aspects of Abandando's involvement with Murder, Inc. was the sheer number of lives he took. It is estimated that he was responsible for the deaths of at least 20 individuals during his time as a contract killer. The financial rewards for Abandando's murderous activities were substantial. He would often receive a payment of $500 for each successful hit, a significant sum of money during that time. This financial incentive, combined with his natural talent for killing, made Abandando a valuable asset to the organization. However, the reign of Murder, Inc. and its members would eventually come to an end. Law enforcement agencies, determined to dismantle the criminal empire, launched a series of investigations and prosecutions. In 1941, Abandando's crimes caught up with him, and he was convicted of murder. The trial that followed was a spectacle, with Abandando's brutal acts of violence laid bare for the world to see. The evidence against him was overwhelming, and he was sentenced 
sentenced to death. For the next nine months, Abandando awaited his fate in Sing Sing prison, knowing that his days were numbered. On February 19, 1942, Abandando was executed by electrocution. The once feared hitman met his end in the same violent manner in which he had taken the lives of others. His execution marked the end of an era for Murder Inc., as other members of the organization were also convicted and executed. Alexander Solonik Known as the Super Killer, Solonik was a notorious hitman who rose to infamy in the early 1990s. Standing at a mere 5 feet 6 inches tall, he defied all expectations and became one of the most feared assassins in history. As we delve into the life of Alexander Solonik, it is crucial to understand the formative years that shaped him into the feared hitman he would become. Solonik's journey began in the elite Soviet Special Forces unit during the height of the Cold War. Born with a natural talent for firearms, Solonik quickly rose through the ranks of the Special Forces unit. His small stature may have deceived some, but his skills were unmatched. He became known for his ability to shoot with deadly accuracy, even in the most challenging of circumstances. Solonik's proficiency with various weapons, including pistols, rifles, and submachine guns, set him apart from his peers. During his time in the Special Forces, Solonik underwent rigorous training that pushed him to his physical and mental limits. He learned advanced combat techniques, including hand-to-hand -hand combat, close-quarters combat, and tactical maneuvers. The Cold War era was marked by intense geopolitical tensions, and the Soviet Special Forces Unit played a crucial role in protecting the interests of the Soviet Union. Solonik and his fellow soldiers were trained to carry out covert operations, gather intelligence, and eliminate high-value targets. Solonik's time in the Special Forces Unit exposed him to the harsh realities of war and the dark underbelly of espionage. He witnessed the brutality of combat and the sacrifices made in the name of national security. These experiences would shape his worldview and set him on a path that would lead to a life of crime and violence. However, the disbandment of the Special Forces Unit marked a turning point in Solonik's life. With the end of the Cold War, the unit was no longer needed, and its members were forced to find new paths. After the disbandment of the elite Soviet Special Forces Unit, Alexander Solonik found himself at a crossroads. His desire to serve his country led him to enroll in a prestigious police academy, hoping to continue his career in law enforcement. However, fate had a different plan in store for him. For reasons that remain unknown, Solonik was discharged from the police Academy, leaving him disillusioned and searching for a new purpose. Solonik's first taste of the criminal world came when he found work as a gravedigger. It was a far cry from his aspirations of being a police officer, but it was within this seemingly mundane job that he would encounter individuals who would introduce him to a life of crime. Falsely accused of sexual assault, Solonik found himself facing an eight-month prison sentence. However, this setback would prove to be a catalyst for his transformation into a ruthless contract killer. During his trial, Solonik managed to escape from the police station, evading capture and disappearing into the shadows. His escape took him to the vast and unforgiving landscapes of Siberia, where he sought refuge and anonymity. But Solonik's criminal instincts and thirst for power would not allow him to remain hidden for long. In prison, he faced a brutal attack by 12 inmates, but against all odds he emerged victorious, defeating each and every one of his assailants. News of Solonik's incredible feat spread like wildfire, reaching the ears of Russian organized crime outfits. Recognizing his exceptional skills and unwavering wavering determination, they saw him as a valuable asset. Solonik was recruited as a contract killer, targeting high-ranking members of rival mafia gangs. Solonik's reputation as a deadly assassin grew rapidly. He became known for his dual-wielding pistol technique, a skill that allowed him to take down heavily guarded targets with precision and speed. His ability to infiltrate heavily fortified locations and eliminate his victims earned him the nickname Super Killer. But Solonik's life as a contract killer was not without its risks. The constant danger and the ever-present threat of retaliation weighed heavily on him. He lived in a world where trust was a luxury he could not afford, always looking over his shoulder, aware that his next job could be his last. Eventually, Solonik's luck ran out. He was arrested and imprisoned, his reign of terror seemingly coming to an end. However, true to his nature, he managed to escape once again, leaving law enforcement baffled and the criminal underworld in awe of his audacity. As Alexander Solonik's criminal career continued to unfold, he found himself in Greece, where he would establish his own criminal enterprise. Enterprise. This marked a significant turning point in his life as he transitioned from being a contract killer to becoming a powerful figure in the criminal underworld. Greece provided Solonik with the perfect opportunity to expand his operations and solidify his position of power. With its strategic location and connections to various criminal networks, it served as an ideal base for his illicit activities. Solonik's criminal empire encompassed a wide range of illegal operations, including drug trafficking, extortion, and contract killings. Under Solonik's leadership,
ownership. His criminal enterprise thrived. He surrounded himself with a loyal network of trusted associates, each playing a crucial role in the success of his operation. But as Solonik's power grew, so did the rumors surrounding his alleged death. In 1997, news broke that Solonik had been found dead in Greece. However, many questioned the authenticity of his demise, suspecting that it may have been a cleverly orchestrated ruse to escape the clutches of law enforcement and disappear from the public eye. Speculation surrounding Solonik's alleged death continues to this day. Some believe that he faked his own assassination to evade capture and start a new life under a different identity. Others suggest that his death was the result of a power struggle within the criminal underworld, with rival gangs vying for control of his empire. The truth about Solonik's alleged death may never be known. This was all about the most dangerous mafia hitman ever. Thank you for staying with us. If you enjoy our content, our newest videos are just a click away.